1912. In the scorching deserts of Egypt, a young German paleontologist Ernest Stromer set off on an expedition that would change the world of paleontology forever. The golden sands of the Baharia oasis was his destination. Stromer was ignited by tales of monstrous bones buried beneath the dunes, braving the blistering sun baking his back alive. After days of relentless digging and shifting through sand, they stumbled upon something extraordinary. It was in a gigantic curved claw, unlike anything Stroma has ever seen. As they continued to excavate, they uncovered massive vertebrae, an enormous crocodile-like skull with long conical teeth. The bones were unlike those of any dinosaur known at the time. Stroma named the creature Spinosaurus, meaning spine lizard. Could this be finally evidence of the Leviathan? You see, from the Bible, there are only three possible outcomes. The Leviathan is a myth. The Leviathan is an extinct animal. The Leviathan is still swimming somewhere in the dark, but it has never been found. After all, is it the case that the Leviathan is only mentioned in the Bible? Well, actually, no. Because in the ancient Ugaritic text, a creature named the Lotan is mentioned which bears resemblance to the Leviathan. Lotan is depicted as a multi-headed sea serpent, defeated by the god of Baal. In Babylonian creation myth, the Anuma Elish describes a primordial sea serpent named the Tiamat, which is defeated by the god of Marduk. But there is one problem. The way that these stories are passed down, you see, even before we wrote them down, the supposed sightings will have been passed down by mouth and ear. And we all know how well that goes. We can barely remember details about that stupid thing your strong friend did, the movie you just saw, Trump's assassination, let alone the recounting of the Leviathan within the Old Testament 2000 years ago, which itself is a volatile recollection of an even older pre biblical story. Our journey begins with one of the main texts that introduces the Leviathan, the book of Job. In Job 41, 1 to 34, the Leviathan is depicted as a monstrous sea creature. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie it down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its straw with a hook. Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Here, the protagonist Job faces extraordinary punishments despite his unwavering faith. Satan, seeking to test Job's devotion, asserts that Job is faithful only because of his blessings. God allows Satan to test Job, confident in Job's integrity. First of all, Job loses his wealth. His livestock is stolen or killed. His servants are slain. Soon after, a great wind collapses the house where his children are feasting, killing them all. His friends arrive to comfort him, but instead accuse him of hidden sins, believing his suffering must be a divine retribution. Job insists on his innocence, wrestling with the profound mystery of his undeserving suffering while maintaining his faith in God. Well, of course, just how far can you take it as Job will later cry out to God? He laments of the days of his past where his body is healthy and his life was filled with loved ones. His present suffering is no longer endurable and he demands that God provide an explanation. You see, God gives Job two lessons. The first lesson involves God rapid firing questions on just how stressful the job is to create and maintain the universe. I mean, when you can't clock out of a shift and you have to keep track of the feeding habits of lions, controlling the weather and every blade of grass. And you thought your job was hard? Shame on you. 
And the second challenge is for Job to capture the Leviathan and make it his servant. God reminds Job that even if he is thinking of capturing Leviathan with harpoons or fishing spears, that he needs to consider the battle that will take place. If Job does engage in battle, it will be the first and only time he does battle with the Leviathan. It cannot be subdued by any man. This is a false hope, as he is laid low even at the sight of him. In other words, Leviathan is a creature that brings fear into the heart of men, whereas he is afraid of no one. So why on earth is God putting so much emphasis on trying to tame this monster? It's not like in June where poor Atreides successfully rides a sandworm. No, no, no. The Leviathan is much, much bigger. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan. The fleeting serpent and Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon, that is the sea. God's point with this description of the Leviathan is to show Job just how powerless he is against this creature. The detailed descriptions of the Leviathan's might and invincibility serves to remind us of human limitations. If Job cannot hope to control the Leviathan, how can he hope to understand and question God's greater plan? This book tells us that, hey, you think you're the top shit, but there are even bigger people out there who can out shit bigger shits. One of the most important aspects that they want us to adopt is humility. So the Leviathan is a badass. That's for sure. But why is it mentioned in five distinct verses over three books? You see, it brings us to our third point, the search for the real-life counterpart to the Leviathan. Creation scientists have searched for fossils that match Leviathan, but with so many variations in what the creature can do, is there any hope that we can find the right fossil? Ichthyosaurus resembling dolphins in appearance are too small to be considered the leviathan. Mosasaurs, known for their massive toothy mouths and reaching lengths of up to 45 feet, lacked significant neck structures according to fossil records. Furthermore, it's doubtful that their flippers can enable them to drag their streamlined body onto the shore in the manner described for the leviathan. Plesiosaurs, potentially large enough and equipped with necks and nostrils, had heads that seemed too small to evoke the awe attributed to the Leviathan's head. Yet ancient civilizations have more to say on this. In his book, The Authenticity of the Book of Jonah, historian Bill Cooper relayed a passage from Pliny the Elder's natural history. The bones of this monster to which Andromeda has said to have been exposed, or brought by Marcus Sacorius from Joppa in Judea during his eldership and shown at Rome among the rest of the amazing items displayed. The monster was over 40 feet long and the height of its rib was greater than that of an Indian elephant, while its spine was one to half feet thick. Cooper also relates Pliny's notes of a washed up carcass of 120 teeth, each between 9 and 6 inches long. And Pausanias mentions an enormous sea creature skull which was kept at a sanctuary in Asclepius. Because going back to the Spinosaurus, you had a body length of 50 feet, one that surpasses the T Rex. Show 41 further recounts the Leviathan to be this creature comfortable in water. Spinosaurus fits this definition quite well, as recent research indicates that it spent significant amount of time in aquatic environments, hunting fish and other aquatic prey. Its semi-aquatic nature aligns with the Leviathan's behavior of crawling or walking on the bottom of rivers or shallow bodies of water. You can look at its jaws and teeth. Leviathan is noted for its terrible teeth or around. Spinosaurus had long narrow jaws with a mix of round reptile-like teeth and larger dinosaur-like teeth, making it a formidable 
predator, or even its sail and tail. Spinosaurus had a distinctive bony sail on its back, up to 7 feet high, which might explain the wake or path left in the water described in Job 41 verse 32. We know less about our seas than we know about space. And even with this extensive fossil record that we have, less than one tenth of 1% 1 of all animal species that have ever lived become fossils. That's like a whole country of bloodlines just gone missing. When sea creatures die, their bodies often decompose or they're scavenged before they can be buried by sediments. Even if they are quickly covered, the water's movements can erode or scatter the remains. The ideal conditions for fossilization, such as rapid burial in an oxygen poor environment, are pretty rare, making the discovery of well preserved ancient sea fossils a remarkable and infrequent occurrence. So, is the Leviathan real? The answer is more complex than we think. The Leviathan, as described in the Bible, is probably a blend of symbolism and real world inspirations. We're fucking scared of the unknown, so we have this tendency of making something appear human, so we can understand it a little bit better. But this only steers us away from the truth. 